Hi, you're very welcome to the Atlantic Salmon Trust Spring Updates, where we're going to invite guests from across the uh, fisheries world to chat to us about their projects and the work that they have on hand. And this morning for our first update, we're joined by Chris, Chris Conroy, a friend of mine, and Chris runs the, um, the projects and runs indeed the work of the Ness Board, and he's the director of the Ness Salmon District Board. And we're also joined by Byron Pace, and Byron is a filmmaker, and he's also a very keen supporter of the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Byron, I'm, I'm sure you have lots of questions that you'd like to ask Chris about the great work that himself and his team have been doing on the uh, tracking project over the past year. So I leave it over to you to ask a few questions to Chris, and I'll join in as appropriate if that's okay. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks very much, Ken. Um, there's some fascinating work being going on. Uh, maybe as a, as a way of uh, background, Chris, you could just tell everyone a little bit about your background and your involvement within uh, the Nest District Salmon Fishery Board before we go and talk about the, the Moray Firth tracking project. Oh, hi, guys. It's great to speak to you today. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the lucky few people, I think, that always knew what I wanted to do for a job. I, I was, um, I've been fishing since I was eight and even then I knew I wanted to work in the fisheries sector. Um, so I spent, um, I got, got a degree in biology um, and a, a master's degree in aquatic resource management and went on to work for the Environment Agency for about 12 years uh, in, in fisheries. Spent a little bit of time working um, in the private sector as a principal consultant and then moved up to Scotland um, worked on the River Neighbour for a little while, and then I've been here on the Nest for about seven years. So what is, uh, what is your day-to-day -day as director of, of the board? What are you involved with in terms of, in terms of projects? Not, maybe not specifically the Mario Firth tracking projects. We're going to talk about that specifically, but uh, what are the other things that you're involved in and your responsibilities? Yeah, so, so my job as the director or the CEO of the board is to make sure, what well, is to manage the day-to-day -day operations. So we do um, three three main things, which is fisheries um, science or fisheries monitoring, which is where we gather evidence. We do, then we do fisheries management, which is where we apply that evidence to the protection of fish stocks. And then we do um, also do fisheries enforcement to make sure there's no illegal exploitation of fish. So all of our work revolves around that. And then um, the primary aim of everything we do is to maximise smolt escapement or the number of wild healthy smolts that go from our rivers rivers into the sea. So everything we do all connects with that. that that's a perfect lead into the, the tracking project itself, it, itself. Why were you so keen to be to be involved in it? Well, I mean, this is obviously a massive project. Um, it's the biggest of its type in Europe. So the prestige of being involved in it was great. But on a sort of more practical level, although we are, I believe, the biggest catchment in the highlands, uh, the actual value of the salmon fishery, of the nest salmon fishery, is relatively low compared to others, such as the Spay and the Dee. And that's because we have relatively small sections of, of river fishing, which is really good quality river fishing, but there's a lot of large lochs, which means the value of the fishery is lower than, say, for example, the Dee or the, or the Spay. Um, so that means that our resources are much lower. So the, the, the questions that are being asked by this project are questions that we've been wanted answered for a long time, but we wouldn't have had the resources to deliver ourselves. So by working in partnership with the, you know, the, the expert, experts involved in this project um, was a great opportunity for us to answer those questions. Yeah, so, so collaborative working across the board is hopefully you're gonna be able to achieve things that you couldn't have achieved by yourself. Can you, can you expand on what, what this project is? I mean, it has a, a very uh, grand title. I think most people are aware that salmon stocks across the, all of the British Isles have declined markedly uh, in the preceding decades. So what is the, the tracking project aiming to achieve? Well, yeah, so, um, so basically, as we said earlier, the, the key thing is getting as many wild, healthy smolts out of the river system. So at the moment, we're seeing a decline in the numbers of returning adults. Um, many believe that that is due to um, climate change and, and, and particularly impacts at sea, um, which we ha unfortunately have very little control over ourselves. But what we can do is we've got a, a better opportunity to manage actually in the freshwater reaches of the river. So what this study does is it, it tracks salmon smolts as they're, as they're migrating downstream and looks for what we would call pinch points or areas where the fish um, may disappear um, for various reasons 
and that then allows us to focus in on management. Um, so if, if there's an area where, this, where, we, where we can see a particular issue, we can then zoom in on that and say, uh, is there anything we can do to help the smolts get past that point um, so we, we have more fish going to sea and then hopefully more returning adults? Interesting. So what is the actual physical infrastructure that you've had to put in place in order to do this monitoring? So, I mean, most of the infrastructure actually we, here was, was in, in, uh, put in place by the Atlantic Salmon Trust and their team at the time. Obviously, we helped uh, identify the locations, but um, basically acoustic receivers, um, which listen to the tags, basically, at, at key locations through, throughout the river system. So as you go from receiver to receiver, you collect information. Each fish sends a ping um, and we can, um, we can gather in various sets of information. I mean, I don't know if Ken wants to add to that at all. Yeah, um, I think it might, it might be worth um, just maybe just explaining to Byron the, the, the extent of what we were trying to do and building on that idea of, of the pinging. Um, in the Mare Firth, you have uh, seven rivers uh, that we're looking at. And the seven rivers that we're looking at, they account for an enormous proportion of uh, the adult salmon returning to the UK. So you're looking at a situation where in the one bay, you can actually do a huge amount to try and monitor exactly what Chris was saying, the output, if you like, of the factory. So if you look on each of those as a component of a giant factory that's feeding smolts into the bay, what we're interested in doing is actually tracking individual fish and groups of those fish out and looking at where they fall, where, where are we losing fish in terms of fresh water, and then zoning in on what we call domains, because all of this is feeding into a new framework that we're developing called the Likely Suspects Framework. And what we're trying to do then is we're trying to understand in each of these boxes exactly why we're losing fish and what we can do to try and uh, save more smolts heading out to sea in this particular instance. And our belief is that if we can actually boost the overall numbers of wild smolts going out into the ocean, we will certainly to some extent compensate for some of the issues that are outside of our control in the marine environment. So in summary, that's really what we're doing. And these little tags that Chris and his guys, and indeed all of the other boards who were incredible in terms of the amount of support and interest they took in the project. Um, all of these little tags that are going into the fish have an individual code. And as they go past a, a receiver, we can see exactly where Harry is at any particular point in time. And it works really well. Maybe we can just backtrack just for a moment, because I'm just conscious of the fact that some people may be watching this are not particularly au fait with the life cycle of a salmon. Uh, and we've been using the term smolt. Some people might not know what that is. Chris, can you just uh, very briefly and succinctly explain that, that life cycle and at what point uh, you're intervening to tag them and where you expect them to go from tagging to returning to the river again? Yeah, okay. So if you start at the adult salmon, I think most people are familiar with photos of silver salmon leaping waterfalls. So Adults return, but they spend a bit of time at sea, we'll come back to that, but they return to fresh water, migrate to their spawning grounds, and they create um, nests or what we call reds in the bed of the river, um, and they lay their eggs in those, in those nests. Then the fish spend, in our, in our catchment, usually um, two to three years in fresh water. And first, first of all, they, they're, a, they be, they're called fry, they're less than a year old. When they're over a year old, they're called par. And then after two to three years, the largest, fittest of these fish tend to then um, go through a process called smultification, where they they basically prepare themselves for for return to, to heading to the sea. Um, they turn silver. They grow quickly, but they grow longer rather than fatter, so they're quite elongated. And um, the fin tips turn turn dark a dark colour, and they the behaviour changes. These these par are usually quite territorial and quite aggressive, um, and they live at the bed of the river. Um, but when they when they start smultifying or go through the smultification process, they they um, shoal. They start to shoal and gather in groups, and then they they passively migrate downstream, which means they basically drift with the current. And if you see footage of them, they quite they, they basically swim backwards, and then every now and then turn downstream. It's quite amazing to watch. Um, so then they they they're quite vulnerable at that stage because they um, as I say they're drifting. So if there's any blockages or any weirs or dams for example if they're if they're either blocked or they're delayed they're, they could be open um, to increase predation or um, other factors and and then they migrate into the sea 
and we think our fish go to either the Norwegian Sea or as far afield as Greenland um, and we find our fish return either after one year when they're called the grills or up to three years um, as what we call a salmon or a multi-sea winter salmon. So that's the basic kind of life cycle. Okay, so what we're looking at here is trying to understand that smolt phase. So getting the maximum amount of fish into the ocean so that they can do their thing out there, feed and mm -hmm. come back. What do we know from the results that you've collected uh, from mm -hmm. the first year of this project about the loss of smolts from where they start their life as par to ending up in the river? Yeah, well, I mean, I could talk about um, the nest specifically. I mean, I don't know if, if Ken wants to add anything at this point, but... Um, so if you, if you go ahead on the nest first, we could yeah. maybe make more general points. Yeah, so, the so the nest, actually, the results of the, of the, of the nest were quite startling. Um, we found that uh, looking just at the freshwater reaches of the system, um, of, the, of uh, all the smolts that were tagged, only 9% made it to the mouth of the river, which is a very low proportion. Um, obviously, a very concerning result. But the good news is we, we now know that there's an issue there and that's going to enable us to, to look into it and say, OK, is this, is this the natural level? I mean, would only 9% of the smolts get to the sea normally or are there specific issues within the nest system where, or particular locations where we're losing smolts that we could potentially address so we can increase that the proportion of smolts leaving the river system. So, and that compares to other river systems in the study. And I think the average, Ken, was about 50%, was it, across the river yeah, system? Around 50, yeah. 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 yeah so, so. Uh, in reality, uh, Byron, what, what has happened is that um, in looking at the results, it has been very consistent over all the rivers. Obviously, variable in terms of the actual percentages, but consistently we're getting the message we need to look more closely in terms of the middle and upper reaches and seeing exactly what's happening. Now, the one caveat I have to put in here, which is really important, a lot of the studies that have been done over the last 40 or 50 years, looking at marine survival and so on, a lot of those studies have started when these little silver smolts actually reach an area just above the coastline and they're monitored from that out to sea and back. So it has caused some confusion in the sense that this is the first time we've actually got a handle as to what's happening in freshwater. So the question really is exactly what Chris is saying. First of all, we have to know, is this completely natural? If it's not natural, why is it higher in some of these rivers than in others? And there are some data from some other rivers that would indicate that in the Marais Firth, we are seeing higher numbers than in some other rivers. Tentatively, that's what we're seeing. So what we're doing now is we're actually zoning in and this is the whole idea of these, uh, of these domains. We're zoning in on locations where we know we've had very high losses. And hopefully, um, obviously this year because of C19, our, our project has been delayed. But in the future, what we'll be doing is looking in detail at those particular areas where the losses were very high. And we're trying to apply some really very novel technologies. So one of the things we're using, for example, is what's called environmental DNA. So basically, if you lose hair from your head, if you happen to lose any fluids out of your body or whatever, and the geneticist can get hold of that, the geneticist can actually you know, identify exactly the individual that has lost that particular component of DNA. What we'll be doing is looking at the bird scat. And again, we'll be dependent on Chris and the people in the boards. This is very much a cooperative program to collect the bird scat for us, see what the birds are feeding on and see how that pattern changes. And the holy grail is to hopefully be able to quantify in grams the sort of level of trout and salmon that are in the gut of the particular predators, if it's predators we're looking at. So we have other technologies looking at, at drones and so on. We're really going to go to town over looking at those particular areas and also looking at some of the physical features in those areas in terms of the water flow and in terms of the other environmental factors, which again, we'll be collecting those data in conjunction with the boards themselves. So it gives us a great opportunity to be able to parse out the actual locations and hopefully provide in the future really practical management responses in terms of what we might be able to do to try and save more small. I think it's worth worth saying that, um, that so far I've got one year's worth of data so it's really important that we replicate that because for all we know that one year could have been I mean we, you know we had low small survival this year 
that may have been particularly low or it may have been high so uh, we need to replicate that but in so doing that we did find a few um, issues with receiver locations for example and um, these acoustic receivers that basically listen to noise and we had a couple that were a little bit too close to weirs for example and the bubbles in the weirs interfere with it and um, we had some in the caledonian canal um, uh, by some lock gates and as that we found that the fish fish that were entering the canal were um, going through the locks at the same time of boats so we had boat engine noise was interfering so what we're doing in the second year is we've revised a few of those locations tweaked it a little bit and um, so a we can get a replica of um of the situation so we can look at the situation again but get slightly better efficiency in certain locations if that makes sense well because I'm, I'm fascinated to see what the results are as you go into the next phases of this uh, one thing I wanted to ask you on, on maybe a, a slightly lighter note um, to the, the hard graft of, of stats and population declines is you've become very well known as an underwater filmmaker and photographer almost from the amount of content that you put up on the, the, the NAS pages. How, how did that start? Yeah, so um, this is really um, all linked to uh, a study we're doing looking at spawning times of fish at various locations around the nest system. So um, we've got a massive lock that you may have heard of called Loch Ness in the middle of our system. And I think it a few has people quite, have heard of Loch Ness around the world. Uh, yeah, it, has, <laughs> it has quite a, it has quite a, um, quite a, an, an, an influence on temperature in the river nest, which flows out of, out of Loch Ness. And what we've found is the fish, the salmon that is, and the trout actually, in the river nest spawn almost a month later than anywhere else in the system and actually anywhere else in the highlands as well. So we were quite interested to learn more about that. And if historically people have, look, have looked at um, salmon reds or nests and looked at when they appear, but we've taken a slightly different approach where we put cameras in at spawning time and we're actually looking at the behavior of the fish rather than the, the reds. So we're looking for um, indicators of behavior. We can see pre-spawning behavior, spawning behavior and post-spawning behavior. So we're, we're basically compiling all that and looking at um, you know the science behind this um, but as a result on the back of that we've produced a lot of really interesting video so we thought um, rather than keep it to ourselves we should really share it and it and it makes people more aware of the salmon more, more generally. You seem to have some wonderful success but I know from spending a little bit of time with you um, up near Loch Ness that a lot of that is down to a huge amount of time on the ground and knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not luck. Well I mean, oh, there's a bit of luck maybe. A lot of luck, yeah. No, so it's, it's really understanding the biology of the fish. So you understand what you need to know is where the fish are going to be at a certain time. Um, and once you figure that out, then it's actually not that time consuming. So um, it depending on what you're trying to film. Um, in this case, for example, the, um, it, with the Murray Firth, we've got some really nice footage of salmon smolts migrating downstream. Um, once you know when they, when they migrate, whether you, where you've got areas where they like to come past the camera, um, you just literally leave a camera in there and, and, and then the look kicks in. If, if they pass that day, then you get it on camera. If not, you don't. So, um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, yeah, I, I, I've had a fantastic time speaking to yourself and Ken today. And I'm looking forward to carrying on this, this series and speaking to more people from the world of uh, fishery science and uh, hopefully bringing everybody a greater understanding of what's happening under the surface of uh, the waters um, across the British Isles.